More cabinet appointments have been unveiled. Taiwan's next economics minister will be J.W. Guo, the chair of Topco Group. Guo has over three decades of experience in the semiconductor sector and has expanded his business across the biotech, optoelectronics and food industries. Observers note that his areas of expertise align with Lai Qingde's vision for Taiwan's economy. Other appointees named on Tuesday include the heads of the National Development Council and Financial Supervisory Commission. Three more appointments for Lai Qingde's cabinet have been announced. Topco Group Chair J.W. Kuo has been named economics minister. Tasked with economic policy and managing utilities like water and power, Kuo will play a crucial role in national development. As minister, I will ask Kuo to leverage his expertise in the energy sector to ensure a stable power supply. I have an acute awareness of the problem caused by the so-called five shortages. However, because I was just appointed today, I will take the time between now and May 20th, and afterward as well, to consult with friends and scholars. I will provide a full report to the public later on. Kuo has worked for years in the semiconductor sector, which is Topco Scientific's main business. He also has experience in biotechnology, optoelectronics, and environmental protection. In 2012, he founded Anya Group, venturing into fisheries, fresh produce retailing, and restaurants. We also deeply understand that the semiconductor industry will influence the direction of Taiwan's economy for the next decade. We are extremely grateful for the path that our government and our president have laid down for Taiwan's tech industry. Kuo's net worth stands at more than 10 billion NT. He's a guest lecturer at National Taipei University. Observers have pointed out that his experience, which ranges from semiconductors to biotech and health, aligns with President-elect Lai Qingde's vision for Taiwan. TSMC is expanding across the globe, and we should be doing the same, expanding our global influence. AI is set to become an important driver for the semiconductor industry over the next 10 to 20 years. Kuo wasn't the only minister revealed. Premier-designate Zhuo Rongtai announced that the National Development Council will be led by Paul Liu, the former chair of PricewaterhouseCoopers Business Consulting Services Taiwan. The Financial Supervisory Commission will be headed by Peng Jinglong, a professor at National Zhengzhou University's Department of Risk Management and Insurance. The new head of the Public Construction Commission will be former Elan Commissioner Chen Jinde. Huang Yannan, a scholar at Academia Sinica's Research Center for Information Technology Innovation, will take over as Digital Affairs Minister. Southern Taiwan University of Science and Technology President Wu Chengwen will head the National Science and Technology Council. Of the six new cabinet members, five have no party affiliation. The appointment is seen as a move to achieve a non-partisan democratic coalition. In the latest round of cabinet picks, one name that's getting attention is Wu Chengwen, the next minister of the National Science and Technology Council. The minister-designate is currently president of Southern Taiwan University of Science and Technology. He was also a star baseball pitcher in his youth. In 1971, he represented Taiwan at the Little League World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Pitching for the Tainan Giants, he helped Taiwan win the Boys Baseball Championship. We won the championship in late August. In October, Taiwan was forced to leave the United Nations. But Little League Baseball was able to bring hope to Taiwan at the time. The championship also fueled the growth of Taiwanese baseball, bringing more attention to the sport. I feel that he made the right choice because his physique never quite bulked up and he wasn't cut out for continuing baseball. I think he still loves the game, but leading the National Science and Technology Council is just the right job for him. After making his mark in youth baseball, Wu took the advice of his parents and teachers, dropping the sport and focusing on his studies. He was accepted to Tainan First Senior High School and later entered the electro Electrical Engineering Department at National Taiwan University. Then he earned a master's and PhD in computer engineering from the University of California before embarking on a career as a semiconductor specialist. 
Taiwan narrowly averted a power crisis on Monday. And Unit 8 at Tai Tatan power plant malfunctioned during the peak evening hours, removing 1.1 million kilowatts of electricity from the grid. With many generators still under repair after the April 3rd earthquake, the reserve capacity dropped to a mere 3.2 percent. And this nearly triggered power rationing nationwide. But the measure was averted due to major power users reducing their demand on the grid. Thai power workers make a risky repair, climbing up pipes for inspection. The April 3rd earthquake led to the malfunction of many power plant units. To this day, Heping power plant remains inoperative, meaning a loss of 1.3 million kilowatts for the grid. On Monday evening, a unit at Datan power plant also went offline, resulting in a loss of 1.1 million kilowatts. That took reserve capacity to just 3.2 percent during the peak evening hours, setting off an orange alert for the power supply. Taiwan was at risk of nationwide power rationing. A water pump failure caused Unit 8 at Datan Power Plant to shut down, removing 1.1 million kilowatts of electricity from the grid. It happened during the peak evening hours, that is, after about 5 p.m., when demand for electricity is at the highest. The incident caused reserve capacity to drop to 3.2 percent. TSMC has a standing agreement with Thai Power that whenever the grid is under pressure, they help out. They turned on their backup diesel generators to generate electricity for Thai Power. The peak load hit 35.27 million kilowatts Monday afternoon, a record high for mid-April. Thai Power had informed major electricity users and contracted firms of a potential need to reduce usage. When the malfunction occurred, big users cut back demand right away, and TSMC contributed nearly 300,000 kilowatts of power to the grid. Thai Power put its hydroelectric plants at full capacity and activated parallel systems to avert a crisis. It was clear that yesterday's reserve capacity was insufficient. If this had occurred in July, when it's hot and everyone has their AC on, what would have happened? And don't forget that Ma'an Shan nuclear power plant will be decommissioned in July. During the day, the plants can store energy by pumping water into the upper pools. That water can be released during the peak evening hours to quickly boost the power on the grid. We also have dynamic generation systems. According to our assessments, this year's power supply will remain within expected levels. Thai Power moved to reassure the public about the summer's power supply. But with the decommissioning of two units at Mai Liao Power Plant and the Ma'an Shan Nuclear Power Plant from July 1st, Thai Power has its work cut out. The legislative yuan has passed new rules for pedestrian safety. Under the new legislation, LOCO can write fines of up to 150,000 NT if they find obstacles to pedestrian traffic on sidewalks. These obstacles might include signage, mailboxes, fire hydrants, and transformer boxes. The new construction office has surveyed data on sidewalks, including sidewalk width, the presence of any installations, and whether these installations could obstruct pedestrian traffic. Obstacles like those from the Taiwan Power Company or cable TV equipment, the city government has long said that these cannot be dealt with. They say, where is this power and telecommunications equipment supposed to go? They want us, the borough wardens, to find solutions for relocation. That's very unreasonable. So with the legislation, the central government is giving us a legal basis for which to demand improvement. According to the new law, if there is a public utility on the sidewalk, the local government must work with the competent authority to remove it. The same goes for privately owned installations, such as signs. Those who fail to make improvements within a set time period will face a fine between 30,000 and 150,000 NT. The 2024 National Geographic Taiwan Photo Contest has kicked off. This year's theme is Taiwan, and there are seven different categories to submit works, including a new astrophotography category. FTV reporter Stephanie Yang has the details. This picture shows 72-year-old master Du Mu He carving a clay god sculpture. This picture was captured by Zhang Jian Yu Song, the winner of the people category of the 2022 National Geographic Taiwan Photo Contest. 
Ling Jianhong, the 2022 Nature Category winner, captured shots of a glass frog. The 2024 National Geographic Taiwan Photo Contest is now open for submissions. Two former winners talked about their works. I want to set up a foundation that can conserve species. Many frogs abroad have been infected by Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis, so they may start to become extinct. It took two years to shoot because during the process of gluing the statue, he had to stop and let the soil of the statue dry. The 2024 National Geographic Taiwan Photo Contest has kicked off. This year's contest calls for entries taken in Taiwan. Works can be submitted in several categories. People, places, nature, ecological sustainability, youth group, bird, and for the first time, astrophotography. The biggest feature of this year's National Geographic Taiwan Photo Contest is that firstly, we added an astrophotography category. It's for photos of deep space, the solar system, and the skies. We hope to invite more photographers who pay attention to wild animals and shoot photos of wild animals in a friendly way and ethical way. We encourage everyone to go to a place with less light pollution to capture the pictures. The National Geographic Taiwan Photo Contest is now in its eighth year. Photographers can submit their entries starting April 16th till July 13th. FTV reporter Stephanie Yang and Ling Dawei in Taipei. Middle East tensions are continuing to weigh on markets. Taiwan shares tumbled again on Tuesday following a sell-off on Wall Street. The TIEX ended at 19,901 after losing 547 points to mark its worst day all year. TSMC lost 18 NT to finish at 788 NT. UMC and MediaTek ended lower by more than 3%. Institutional investors sold a net 57.2 billion NT, with foreign investors offloading more than 38.8 billion NT. The new Taiwan dollar tracked the loss, closing down at 32.490 NT against the greenback. This year's top 100 global innovators are out. 11 Taiwan based organizations made the cut, making Taiwan the third most awarded country in the world. The awards organizer, Global Information Services provider Clarivate, lauded Taiwan for its intellectual property strategy. The honorees include TSMC, MediaTek, Honghai, and the Industrial Technology Research Institute, or ITRI, which was being recognized for the eighth year. Industry leaders stand in file as they're recognized for being among the top 100 global innovators. This year's honorees include TSMC, MediaTek, Etri, Honghai, and Quartronic. For Etri, it's the eighth time earning the distinction. Of course, we work tirelessly. We want our researchers to orient their work toward market demands, to amplify the impact of our patents and intellectual property. The hope is to monetize intangible assets. We've launched a so-called financing program for intangible assets. This can be of significant help to startups in their early stages. Etri has made a strong push to diversify and monetize patents. It's helped small and medium-sized enterprises use their patents to secure bank financing. At the same time, it stayed committed to forward-looking and interdisciplinary research and development, achieving a considerable global impact. This year, ETRI received the most awards out of any Asia-Pacific research institution. Not just in semiconductors, which everybody knows Taiwan's expertise in, but also high-tech areas as well in electronics. And Taiwan plays a very important role in that global innovation ecosystem. Since 2011, global information services provider Clarivate has ranked the world's top organizations in tech research and innovation. Innovation is measured by factors like the number of patents, the quality of the patented ideas, and their impact. This year's list recognized 11 organizations in Taiwan, which were chosen among 1.1 million organizations worldwide. Taiwan ranked third in the world for the fourth consecutive year. With regard to innovation, the government has an extremely comprehensive blueprint and executive strategy for local investment, R&D subsidies and talent development. This year's budget for the plan reaches 156.9 billion NT. 
With strong government support and industry leadership, Taiwan has gained global acclaim for its innovation. The handler gives a command, and the dog rushes forward into a pile of rocks. This is Coca, a rescue dog from Taidong that has passed the highest level of evaluations for the job. After more than 1,000 hours of training, Coca has become well equipped to respond to any disasters. At the most basic level, rescue dogs have to be interested in humans. Due to Taidong's unique environment, rescue dogs don't just have to love food and fun. They must also know to remain undisturbed even if provoked by wild boars, chickens or ducks. Physically, they need to be able to climb all the way up to Jiaming Lake. Dogs like Coca love to eat and play, so that made training easier. For example, to train search skills, we use foods and toys that Coca likes to catch the canine's attention. That way, the dog will want to play. The Taidong County Fire Department has seven rescue dogs. They include Coca, a black Labrador that has passed the International Search and Rescue Dog Organization's Rubble Test Level B, the most advanced evaluation of its kind, as well as the MRT, or Mission Readiness Test. Among others in Taidong is also Dawson, a Labrador retriever that passed the IRO's rubble test level B. After passing the IRO's rubble test level B, Coca was eligible to take the mission readiness test. Last December, Taiwan hosted for the first time the IRO's mission readiness tests for the Asia region. Coca took part in the tests and cleared evaluations for strenuous assessments and 81 skills, lasting 36 hours to attain the highest level of certification for a rescue dog. That has made Coca the top choice to dispatch by the county government. Conditions in real rescue missions tend to be more intense, so the dogs really have to go through this kind of training. When you have a dog, you must really take care of it, just as if it were a child of your own. I read a lot of books to take care of Coca. The handler says training a rescue dog requires as much attention as raising a child. Every step along the way prepares the dogs for any disasters that may come, building up skills that could save people's lives. National Jai Senior High School has updated the lyrics of its anthem ahead of its 100th anniversary. One of the verses that used to say building a new China has been changed to marching into a new era. References to the three principles of the people by Sun Yat-sen has also been removed. The school says the adaptation is not politically motivated. It says the update was approved by a school council after complaints from alumni who said the lyrics were out of touch with the times. Another lyric that was changed pertains to the admission of girls to the formerly all-boys school. The verse, the boys are very ambitious, has been revised to the students at Jiayi Senior High School are very ambitious. Have you wondered what it would be like to trek for 500 kilometers in the snow near the Arctic Circle? That's precisely what ultramarathon runner Tommy Chen did last month at the Montane Lapland Arctic Ultra in northern Sweden. The runner gave a talk in Taiwan about his experience, sharing images of the grueling journey. Chen says that thinking of his family is what pushed him past the finish line. Last month, ultramarathon runner Tommy Chen came second in the Montane Lapland Arctic Ultra, a 500-kilometer foot race in northern Sweden. He was the first Asian participant to complete the challenge. Now in Taiwan, he held an event to share images of his experience. Oh, I don't sleep. Chen recounted the severe conditions he overcame and the loneliness of the challenge. Thinking of his family back in Taiwan gave him strength to make it to the end. Far away, 8,300 kilometers away, my mother must have been praying to Buddha for me. It gave me a sense of strength and stability. I miss my family. Before competing in Sweden, Chen took part in the Montane Yukon Arctic Ultra, a 700-kilometer race in Canada, where he also won a medal. Chen presented his father with the two medals, inviting him to run a race together in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm not spending as much time with my parents, so I hope we get the opportunity to take part in a marathon in a polar region someday, be it 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers. I think it would be an amazing memory. Of course, I don't know if doing that would create a rift in our relationship. Chen faced off against 54-year-old ultramarathon legend Thierry Cobarrue from France. Chen says the experience was inspiring and enriching, but he says he still plans to retire from racing at the age of 43. Next up for Chen is the Four Rangers Ultra in Kenya this September. The Lava Tri Ponghu International Triathlon will be back in action in May. Athletes can enjoy local delicacies and catch a glimpse of the Ponghu International Fireworks Festival, which is held from May to July. FTD reporter at Stephanie Yang has the details. Athletes step on their pedals, pushing into the strong wind. The Lava Tri Penghu International Triathlon will kick off again in May. At a pre-race press conference, race ambassadors Zhang Jiajia, Zhang Jiahao, and Xu Renmao shared their training process and their goal for this year's race. This time I will participate in the 51.5 kilometer race. I am looking forward to it because Penghu has some hilly terrain and it's very windy. It is very challenging. I have done a lot of homework on the long distance part. I put more effort into training compared to last year and the year before that. There is a 113 kilometers and a 51.5 kilometers race. There is also a triathlon for children. For the first time, the race will kick off at Lingtou Beach. This is our first year holding it at Lingtou Beach. In the past, we held it in other places. We want to hold this race at this beautiful beach to give participants a new experience. Again, we will ride to Xiyu and pass the Penghu Great Bridge. We will try to give a preview of the Ironman Taiwan race next year here. At the same time, it is also the first time holding an event in Penghu in conjunction with the Penghu International Fireworks Festival. I hope more people will come to Penghu for sightseeing and enjoy the atmosphere of the fireworks festival. After the race, athletes can enjoy local delicacies and catch a glimpse of the Penghu International Fireworks Festival, which is held from May to July every year. This year's Lava Tri Penghu International Triathlon will take place from May 18th to 19th. FTV reporter Stephanie Yang and Hong Kai in Taipei.